inspiration, brave action, and heartwarming journeys. This is what the Louise H. Reed Show brings you. Now, here's your host, Louise H. Reed. Hello, 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 friends. Wonderful snowy morning here in Ottawa. I hope you are warm and cozy and ready for an amazing hour again this week. Thank you once again for joining me with listeners in over 145 countries and millions of iTunes downloads and ongoing podcasts each month. I'm the fortunate host here every Tuesday at this time to truly explore the journeys of amazing people who have embraced the notion of taking brave, bold action in their lives. I am super excited about my guest today, Joanne Lipman. So let me tell you a little bit about her before we hear from her. So Joanne is one of the U United States leading journalists, is best selling author of That's What She Said, What Men Need to Know and Women Need to Tell Them About Working Together. As Chief Content Officer of Gannett and Editor-in-Chief of USA Today and the USA Today Network, she oversaw more than 3,000 journalists at 110 newspapers. Joanne began her career at the Wall Street Journal, ultimately becoming Deputy Managing Editor, the first woman to attain that post, and supervising coverage that won three Pulitzer Prizes. She subsequently was founding editor-in-chief of a magazine and is co-author of the New York Times education bestseller, Strings Attached, which has also been published across Europe and Asia. There is so much I could share with you about Joanne and I'll just share a few more things before we have the luxury of, of listening to her. She's a frequent television commentator appearing on ABC, CNN, CBS, NBC, PBS, MSNBC and CNBC, among others, and now Contact Talk Radio Network. And her work has appeared in the New York Times, Fortune, Harvard Business Review, and Newsweek. I could go on and on, and I won't, but you can find more information about Joanne on her website, www.joannelipman.com. Without anything more, welcome to the show, Joanne. Thank you, Louise. It's so good to be here. Absolutely. I, my, my regular listeners know that this is my favorite hour of the week. And so thank you for sharing it with me, uh, as well as my listeners. Um, I also want to say thank you to you for writing this book. And I, and I gave the title of the book in your bio and in your, in your intro, the, that's what she said. Um, since reading Lean In in 2013 by Sheryl Sandberg, I've been waiting for the next gem. I truly have. And this was that. This, this was that for me. I'm delighted to hear that. I also, I love seeing all the post-it notes that you're <laughs> using so carefully. That's, it's the, as an author, I cannot even tell you, it's the best possible visual I could possibly see. I, I, so those who are watching on Facebook, I've got like, I, I love my books. This is just what I do. It's my, it's, it shows that it's love. So I'm glad that I got to share that with you That's as awesome. the Awesome. And the highlights, it's the best. <laughs> so, um, I wanted to share with you the thing, the first thing that I read in your book, it's in the introduction actually. And as soon as I read it, I knew I needed to reach out and speak to you. And this is where you really got me. And it, and it never ended, you had me the whole book. You said, we're on the cusp of a new way of thinking, one that unites men and women rather than divides us at work and beyond. Absolutely. And so tell us, what you mean by that? Right, so the, the reason I wrote That's What She Said, the subtitle of that book is actually quite important. It's what men need to know and women need to tell them about working together. And the reason I wrote it is because women talk all the time about the issues we face at work and we talk to one another. And not just about, you know, a lot of the Me Too issues have been in the headlines, um, issues of sexual harassment and abuse, incredibly important to put a spotlight on those issues. When women get together though, we talk about more than that. We talk about the everyday issues that we all face of being marginalized, overlooked, ignored, interrupted, and simply not taken as seriously as the guy who's sitting right next to us. But I came to realize that women talking to each other, while it is an amazing conversation, it's half a conversation. And at best it gets us to 50% of a solution. 
And we really do need men to join us. And as you could tell from my bio, I, I've spent um, years in journalism and the first 20 years of my career in business journalism at the Wall Street Journal, surrounded by really good guys. And I thought, you know, what a shame that when we talk amongst ourselves, we're leaving them out of the conversation. So let's write a book that invites them in, that explains here's what the issues are. And then I also, I interviewed hundreds of men in positions of leadership around the country and beyond um, to talk with them about what are things that they have figured out? What have they learned about closing the gender gap? And so that we could come away with strategies we can all use. Um, thanks for all of that. And what the thing that I took away most from this book, it certainly was a journey, which was which was wonderful because I identified my in you know in in the words that you wrote, I identified myself in a lot of that. But at the very back, you make it so easy for men and women and organizations to take some strategies and go away and, and, and put them to use. So I wanna talk about that but a little bit a little bit later, but okay. um, your book really does, does cover the gamut and goes through that, that takes the, the reader on that journey. Um, what are some of the comments that you've heard from men that have, um, in response to the, the diversity and inclusion, and I'm using the, uh, the air quotes for those who can't see me, the diversity and inclusion work that's been done to date that hasn't been working. Right, right. So one of the one of the really interesting things, I actually had an aha moment that led to the writing of the book. And it was, it was a little over three years ago. And I was on a plane ride. I was going to Des Moines. And I found myself sitting next to this businessman. And he, we're having this really nice conversation. And he's telling me about his new house and the kids and their sports teams. And then he says, so tell me, why are you going to Des Moines? And I said, well, I'm going to speak at a women's leadership conference. And suddenly, <laughs> silence. This otherwise, this otherwise lovely man just like totally freezes. And finally he just throws up his hands and he goes, sorry, I'm a man. Yeah. And, and he proceeds to tell me that his, at, at his bank, he has just gone through diversity training. And he said, it was the worst thing ever. He said, it was like, being punished and sent to the principal's office. And he said that he and his male colleagues came away with one message. And the message they came away with was, it's all your fault. And that really got me. Like, I, I thought, you know, what a shame. These are men we need on our side. And instead they're feeling alienated. And um, so the next day I found myself in this hotel ballroom in Des Moines, talking to a room full of women about the issues we face at work and watching this sea of female heads like nodding in recognition. And I just stopped in the middle of the sentence and I said, you know what? We already know this. We need <laughs> to be in the room to hear this as well. And, and that prompted me, I actually then went and wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal called Women at Work, A Guide for Men that went viral that led to the book. But the first thing I did with the book was I actually dove into the research. And one of the pieces of research that was really revelatory was that it turns out my seatmate had a point, which is diversity training, traditional tr diversity training has failed. Mm -hmm. There is a professor at Harvard by the name of Frank Dobbin, and he looked at 30 years of diversity training at more than 800 companies. And he found that for women, as well as for black women and men, it actually made things worse these groups would have actually done better, had more progress, had there been no training at all. And, and he looked at why was that? And there were a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons it turns out was resentment on the part of the primarily white men who were the subject of the training. So then I went and talked to diversity trainers and one, a guy, this veteran diversity trainer who's been in, doing this for decades and he said, you know what? He said, we started this 30 years ago. It was in, um, it was as a result of lawsuits. That's why we started it. And he said, basically when we started, our process was we beat white guys over the head with a two by four and we tried to make them feel guilty. And he said, and if they cried even better, right? So clearly we've, wow. been, we've embraced these methods that have had exactly the opposite effect of what they were intended to do. 
which obviously is devastating to hear both on um, a human level as well yeah. as an organizational level regarding its expenditures on these things that they were hoping to, to see. Billions of dollars have been spent on this kind of training that really has been counterproductive. So um, how, if there's someone in an organization, a leader in an organizational listen, organization listening right now, how would they know if they had that type of program? Because then I want to be able to move the conversation into, so what are the, some of the small things that yes. we can do differently, but how would they know that that is them right now? Right. So, you know, the, 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 um, we've really moved on from the traditional training to more of unconscious bias training. And the point of unconscious bias training is we all have unconscious implicit biases, women, as well as men, black, white, we all have these biases. And so the idea is to recognize your biases that you're not aware of, and then to come up with strategies to counteract them. So that um, is a little bit less onerous. It, it's still not a cure all. And, and the reason is that any one of these kinds of trainings is a few hours out of your life. And, and I actually spent a bunch of time at Google in researching that's what she said. And um, they had a, an amazing, uh, unconscious bias training. But at the end of the day, I then went and spoke to a couple of female engineers and I asked them about the bias training and they were like scratching their heads like what training, what training? Like they have so many trainings and there's so many other things going on that it's just like a blip in your day. And that's why one of the major pieces of advice that I give to companies and I talk about in the book is how important it is for the leadership of any organization to really own diversity and inclusion and to model it for the rest of the organization. I, I have met in my travels the most amazing diversity and inclusion professionals, HR professionals. They're incredible people. As, as the kids say, they're so woke, right? <laughs> they're amazing. <laughs> but but um, they can't change the culture. The yeah. only people who can really uh, impact the culture, if you want the CEO, the leader of an organization, and I also say you want the CFO, the chief financial officer of any company to also own diversity. And the reason is that every piece of research shows you that, um, that when you have a gender balanced workforce, you are more financially successful. And you have to understand that. I I've been to a lot of companies where because um, I do a lot of corporate speaking and, and at some companies you do the whole, you know, you, you, you talk about diversity and then afterward in the Q&A, someone will raise their hand and say, yeah, we really, really care about diversity, but <laughs> we have to worry about our earnings. And my response to them is you're thinking about this all wrong, right? Th those are not two separate questions. Those are one and the same. And, and to solve the issue, we need to understand this is one and the same issue. And I think what you raise is so critical is that this isn't just uh, a program to have um, so you can win awards as an organization for, you know, being best diversity and inclusion. Um, right. Employee, right. So right? This actually you're, makes business sense. The financials go along with it. You're a hundred percent right, Louise. And the other, the other important thing here is um, as, as you're referring to is it's so important that it's not just like an exercise where you're checking a box and, and a lot of companies, they say, okay, we did our diversity training, we did our unconscious bias training, so boom, we're done. And you're not done, like that, that's checking a box. That's why you have to, it really has to be woven into the culture of your organization. Culture and processes and systems, yeah. um, because it is much more complicated and complex and deep than we, I think we ever really thought it was when we first embarked on this journey, however many years ago, this started, right? You were 100% right, yes. So we talk about um, unconscious bias training not really being enough. And I think that the approach, and you talk about it in your book, and just want to explore it maybe a little bit more right now, I think it's a multifaceted approach to moving the needle. Yes. So um, for those, because I think there's a lot of confusion about this, there's a lot of confusion about all sorts of things including so you know if someone's just realized oh gosh i think our diversity training is a little old school all right so the unconscious bias training we can i know how to quote unquote fix that i can i can you yeah. know shift that a little bit what are those other sort of next sort of key key things to have in place to start to to perpetuate that through the culture right so what i talk about so much in that's what she said are these 
hundreds of little things that women, fo we face every day and they're very um, blatant to us. It, we are highly aware of them, but they are pretty much invisible to men because men don't experience them. And again, if we don't talk about it and open their eyes to it, they're not going to see it because they're not experiencing it. So I talk a, a lot about some very simple interventions um, for things that are very common that happen to women. So for instance, women in meetings, killing, uh, women, I always say meetings are the killing fields of a woman's career. And that is because there's so many of these sort of micro things that happen. One is that women are interrupted three times more frequently than men are. Um, there was Northwestern University studied the Supreme Court of the United States and found that female Supreme Court justices are interrupted three times more frequently than male Supreme Court justices. Um, and then when women make up a minority of the room, which is very frequent, especially in a business situation, um, your voices literally are not heard. And when I do speak to groups, I usually ask for a show of hands among the women. I'll say, how many have you experienced that thing where you say something in a meeting and it's like, nobody heard it. It's like crickets. <laughs> and then two minutes later, some guy repeats exactly what you just said. And everybody turns to him and they're like, hey, Dave, great idea you had, Dave. And Dave gets the credit. And usually 100% of those hands go up because it is something that literally happens to all women. And, and what it comes down to, all of these small things, you know, there, there's the conventional wisdom that women talk more than men, but in fact, in a group, women need to make up the vast majority of a group, 60 to 80%, before they can get half. Wow. And, and, and you, you add it all up and what it is, it, it results in, essentially there is a respect gap that has been documented between men and women. There's been these experiments where you look at a man and a woman in the same job, with the same title, with the same responsibility, and the man will have more influence and more power than the woman will have in the same job. So that's the, the awareness is sort of the key to understanding that. And if I could just give you a really, um, one of the best examples, because one of the things I did for That's What She Said, as I said, I interviewed hundreds of people. Among them were transgender professionals because they're the only people who know what it's like to live on both sides of the divide. And one of the most interesting, and I thought this was so revelatory, there's a, a neuroscientist at Stanford University by the name of Ben Barris. Ben Barris was born as Barbara Barris. And he transitioned in middle age after already having a very successful, establishing a very successful academic career. And Ben Barris told us that after his transition, he went to a scientific conference, he gave a scientific presentation, and in the audience, one scientist turns to another scientist and says, wow, that Ben Barris, he is so much smarter than his sister, Barbara. So <laughs> it's kind wow. of astonishing, right? And Ben Barris, who sadly passed away recently, but Ben Barris, uh, when we spoke to him, told us that, you know, like everything changes when you are transgender, but perhaps the most astonishing change for him was that as a man, he commanded instant respect. And it was something he was completely unaccustomed to. Women were constantly having to earn it and earn it and earn it again. And by the way, for women who belong to another underrepresented group, so if we're talking black women, you know, if you're talking ethnic, sexuality, race, women who belong to more than one underrepresented group have the, what's called the prove it again syndrome. Like they just have to constantly prove themselves. Whereas men and particularly white men, it comes automatically. There's an assumption that they are competent. Yeah, it's a, there's a privilege, isn't there? There's yeah, a privilege that's, that comes with that. And when you are the privileged one, the, I have to say, I'm privileged in other regards, right? So yeah. you know, I come from a very good family and you know, very well off. That's a privilege that I can't understand then or I have no appreciation for others. Right. I, I try to have empathy, but I, don't, I truly don't know that world at all. So right. similarly. Right. It's very similar. And, and white women enjoy a privilege that women of color do not. So, there, so, I, so much of, of this is really about awareness, is being aware to the slights of others be, be, and aware of our own behavior. What might we be doing 
Um, and, and like a very tiny, for instance, but um, I, I, uh, Facebook allowed me to take um, unconscious bias training with its employees. Awesome. And um, shortly afterwards, so I went out to, to San Francisco to go take the training. And then I checked into a hotel. And after the bias training, I went to go check into the hotel. And there were, um, there were three check-in lines. And two were women and one was an Asian man. And I immediately went in the Asian man line thinking, oh, he's going to be faster and smarter, which is like, oh my gosh, <laughs> unconscious bias training. How can, I do, how can I be that person? Right? So, you know, we, you just have to be conscious yeah. of it. And, and I had another thing that happened um, where I was in discussions. I'd been in telephone discussions um, with a couple of um, television producers and it was a team. It was a man and a woman. And I did not know who was senior, the man or the woman. And then we, we arranged, um, they came out from California and we met in person. And I found myself, I stopped myself before I did it, but I found myself immediately going to the man to, to introduce myself to the man first. Before I said, holy, like, how yeah. do I know? Like, how do I know who's senior? Why am I doing that? And, yeah. and so I realized I, I was in the middle of writing the book and I realized my own actions, I had this, like, these unconscious biases that I had to overcome. But that's the point of that's what she said is so that all of us can have that heightened awareness so that we can counteract our own biases. I really appreciate you sharing that so openly and vulnerably because here we are listening to you as an expert in the field and you just openly shared that you two have these. And so I think that really removes some of the pressure that listeners may be feeling and those people who are involved in this unconscious bias training may be feeling yeah. um, when they, you have the shot, shot, you know, the spotlight shone on you. Yeah. And it's really not about that at all. Yes, and I, I will tell you, I am constantly vigilant about this. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that my children are also now vigilant about this. But I, I, I sometimes tell this story. I think my daughter was born vigilant. I have a daughter and a son. <laughs> my daughter, my daughter um, when pretty much as soon as she could learn how to talk, um, pointed out to me that I always asked her to clear the table after dinner, but I never asked my son. Um, I did not notice. Yeah. In, and she, she noticed, and I think that's great, by the way, that we have this generation coming up that is much, much more conscious uh, than their elders are about all of these issues. I mean, that gives me a lot of hope. It does, and what an interesting little experiment you have on it going on in your own home. I have four boys, so they equally get um, the, the, the work spread amongst them. I did wanna go back to a really relevant example, a very tangible example of being in a meeting where um, you as a woman may be interrupted. So let's say that is occurring. What is the best thing that she could do, that one could do? So I'm, I'm being interrupted a lot in the meeting. What's my best approach in terms of dealing with that? So there are a few strategies. And, and um, I think the most effective strategies are those in advance of the meeting. And it has to do with building allyships, like having allies. And your allies can be male or female. Um, but uh, for example, um, uh, there is a, um, there are, are some executives who now actually have changed the rules of their meetings. Uh, I say interrupt the interrupters, which is anyone in the meeting should feel free when they notice the woman being interrupted to call it out and to say, wait, Louise was speaking. I want to hear what she has to say. But I also met executives, male and female, who have introduced no interruptions rules in their own meetings so that whoever, and, and this actually first came to me from a television producer. And he told me that um, he had a writer's room. This is the, the guy who, who actually was the head writer on The Walking Dead, the television show, and before that, The Shield. And in a writer's room, you've got like a dozen people sitting around a table and they're all pitching plot points for your series. And he said, you only had two women and they were failing and he could not figure out why they were failing. And he said, it finally occurred to him that every time they opened their mouths, they were interrupted by their male colleagues and they never got their pitches out. So he created this rule, no interruptions for whoever's pitching. And he said it transformed the writer's room. These women succeeded. It made his shows better. And so it, it, it 
transform the entire process. There's a couple of other um, really great interventions. One is amplification. This was actually popularized by the women of the Obama administration because Obama had more women than any previous mm -hmm. or subsequent administration, <laughs> but still fewer women than men. And the women felt bulldozed. And so they came up with this idea. So let's say, Louise, you and I are in the meeting. Um, you say something. I repeat exactly what you said, and I give you credit by name. And what that does is it makes sure that your idea does not die on the vine. Uh, and it also makes sure that when our buddy Dave over here um, repeats your idea two minutes later, we still know, hey, that was Louise's idea first. Uh, and there's something very, very similar, which I also love. Um, this came to me from women at a consulting firm. Um, so the research, I did a lot of research on the data. And the research shows us that actually women are as good or better than men um, when it comes to advocating on behalf of other people. It's stereotypically women advocate for others. Women are worse than men, it's not your imagination, um, at advocating on our own behalf. And frankly, like so many other things, when I was writing the book, I came across this research and I'm like, oh, I thought it was just me. So many of these things I thought were just me because I suck at advocating for myself. But it turns out that's a female thing and it's because we are penalized for it as women, whereas men are rewarded. So the women at this consulting firm, they didn't know the research, but they kind of intuitively felt that way. So this idea they came up with is called brag buddies. So brag buddies is Louise and I have the same boss. I tell Louise my awesome achievements. <laughs> you tell me your awesome achievements. And then we both go to the boss and we brag about the other one. And these women said it was very, very successful. We're much more comfortable bragging about somebody else. And, um, and it gets our achievements up to the, to the bosses. And also, like, what a great idea. And so I love all of these things that you're sharing with us right now. But is not, is the, does the research not also show that when women do share their own successes, it's not looked very favorably upon? That's right. Women are penalized when we talk about our own successes. It is seen as unseemly, abrasive, like all of those female coded words. Bossy. Bossy, pushy, like all things Passive, that, yeah. that only go for women. Um, that's what happens when we, when we talk about our own achievements. Whereas men who do exactly the same thing, they, you, they've tried this. Like you can have a man and a woman essentially read from the same script and the man will get kudos for it and the woman will be chastised for it and she'll be penalized for it. So Joanne, one of the many things that I have appreciated about your book, I do love research. My, my degrees are in biology. So I certainly love, I love all the science and all the research and all the numbers. Um, again, I've already emphasized a few times the tangible takeaways and strategies. Um, but I, I just, I really appreciate um, just the, the story that you've woven in of your own, um, your own uh, journey. So why don't you tell us a little, go, go turn the clock back a little bit and share with us some of the successes that you've had. And I love how you talked about the bosses that didn't give up on you in yeah. terms of still offering, still offering, not assuming still offering. So could you talk to us a little bit about that and what that means to the listeners right now? Oh, absolutely. And I, this was one, one of the most important lessons that I learned that I talk about, and that's what she said. And I will also tell you, I didn't appreciate it until I sat down to write the book. I didn't I, I never sort of verbalized what happened, but so I started out um, at the Wall Street Journal and um, I had two, I got married. I was, you know, I started there right out of college. Then I got married and then I had two kids in two years. And um, when I came back from my second maternity leave, my bosses offered me a promotion. And I said no, because I really was kind of overwhelmed with all the child things. And, you know, so that was fine. And, but what happened was, so what happens most of the time is women who have children, we very, very often see what happens is they get mommy tracked. They are either no, no longer taken seriously or, um, and I've been in the room many, many times when this happens, there's a meeting and there's a great opportunity and somebody will say, oh, Chloe would be so great for that job. And somebody else in the room will say, oh, you know what? She just had a baby. She's not gonna wanna travel. She's not gonna wanna work that many hours or her husband has a great job. She's not gonna wanna move, right? And so then they just cross Chloe off the list and Chloe- They decide, they decide for her. 
Chloe's career is done, right? So in my case, what happened was I said, no, they came back to me six or eight months later, the next time there was an opportunity and said, do you want to throw your hat in the ring? And I said, no, again, I will tell you, this went on for almost five years. <laughs> my bosses came back to me regularly every time there was a great opportunity and said, do you want to throw your hat in the ring? And I said, no, for almost five years, but they never crossed me off the list. And so after almost five years, my son now was in kindergarten and my daughter was older. And um, my boss came to me, the Paul Steiger, who ran the newspaper at the time, uh, came to me and said, would you like to invent a brand new fourth section for the Wall Street Journal? And I was like, hell yes, I would. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, you know, it, that then set the table for the entire remainder of my career. And I think about that so much now because had... I've been in the situation most women are in, I would have been crossed off the list that very first time. I never would have had the opportunity, that fourth section, by the way, became Weekend Journal. I never would have had the, t the opportunity to create Weekend Journal, then Personal Journal, then to go on to be an editor-in-chief of a magazine, and then to go run all of the content at Gannett for 110 newspapers. M my entire career would have been wiped out all because of that, you know, one no when my kids were babies. And so what I say to people is be that person in the room who says, don't cross her off the list. Let's, first of all, let's ask her. And if she does say no, don't give up on her. Um, you know, like give her, ask, keep asking, keep asking. And, and I also talk about women who don't stay in the workforce. I stayed in the workforce, but I talk about women who leave the workforce because this to me is one of the most untapped, greatest untapped resources that we have in the world, which are really smart, ambitious, educated, working women who, because they can afford it, maybe want to take off. And, and men, by the way, it's supposed for men too. People who maybe for family reasons um, choose or maybe have to take off to take care of children or elderly relatives. And then they try and get back in. And I have a chapter in That's What She Said, and it's called Invisible Women. And I say that because these women who are off for five years or more, who try to get back in, they are completely invisible to employers. And, and just in the United States, economists say if we could get these women back in, it would add over $2 trillion to the economy. Mm -hmm. And, and not only that, these women, you know, kids grow up so fast, right? And so you've got these women who have all this energy and ambition and talent, and they are going to hit the ground running no matter what. They are so um, ambitious and have so much energy. Yeah, so and, driven. And, and why are we wasting their talents? And so one of the things I do talk about are what are some policy strategies we can put in place? So first of all, we don't lose track of these women. And then secondly, we can bring them back. And one of the most successful policies is, and more companies are starting to now do this, are, it's called, they're called returnships. And returnships are a lot like internships, um, but they're for people who have been out of the workforce, or for women and men who have been out of the workforce. And what it does is it allows these people to come back in um, and to refresh their skills, then they get a sense of the company, the company gets a sense of them, and then it could either lead to permanent employment at the company, or even if it doesn't, they now have a refreshed resume that will help them find a job elsewhere. Right, and, and it's just a, it's, it's such a simple solution. Yes, yeah, and it's such a smart solution. Such a smart solution, but using, we have this capability already, and it's just sort of repurposing it. Right, like you said, you're repurposing internship and just putting it on a different uh, sector of the population. So, and the other thing about it is what, what, what I've been encouraged about is so now I've, like I said, I've spoken to a lot of companies and I recommend returnships and some of these other policies. And one of the companies that I've spoken at a couple of times is NBC Universal. And um, I just heard recently that they've now created a returnship program, which is fantastic. It's so great to see companies that are, you know, there's not enough being done like strategically, changing policies in companies in my view. But when I see things like that, I say, yes, we're starting to actually not just talk the talk, but now we're starting to walk the walk. We are, well, our, our workforce, the demographics of our workforce, the needs of our workforce um, have just changed dramatically since these original structures, organizational structures and policies and et cetera were put in place. 
Yeah, absolutely. And so this type of flexibility um, supports people of all needs, exactly. whether it, yeah, whether it's people like you said, whether it's people, women leaving the workforce to raise children or those having to look after a sick relative, right? right. There's lots of ways um, that this supports the organization. Um, I'd like to sort of shift the conversation a little bit now to focus on men. Yes. There are so many, so many great men who want to do the right thing. And I think that even more so since this Me Too movement are now hesitant and somewhat nervous. So like whether it's that gentleman that you were speaking with on the plane that you referenced that was part of the, the trigger for writing your book. Um, my dad is a great example of someone who's always wanted to, to do right by everyone, including women in the workforce. I yeah. think there's been a little bit of a, a bit, people are a bit gun shy. So can you yeah. tell us what's happening now, how this is, how they should navigate this? Right, right. So, so you're hundred percent right about this unease. And this is again, a major reason I wrote that's what she said. I wanted a book men felt comfortable reading and understanding because it turns out that one of the major issues that men face when they do want to get involved in helping to close the gender gap, it's what, what holds them back very often is fear. So Catalyst did a survey of professional men and it asked them what might prevent you from being a champion of gender equality at work. 74% of them cited fear. And the fear that I talked about, part of it was fear of, um, of, of um, loss of status, um, fear of being uh, ridiculed by other men. Um, but part of it was fear of saying the wrong thing to us women. In other words, they're afraid they will say something wrong to us and we're gonna bite their heads off. <laughs> And um, that's a real thing. And so one strategy that I also tell women is, you know, there's a lot of organizations now that have these women's resource groups yeah. um, that for employees. And I, and I ask them, I say, you know what, invite men. You don't have to have them at every meeting, but there's a wonderful example um, of a consulting firm. One of the senior um, women told me about, she said they had very, very few senior women in this consulting firm. And they were having a firm-wide meeting of just the women. And the, the few senior women got together and said, you know what? What we're going to do is each one of us will invite one senior man. Mm -hmm. And she said, when those invitations went out, they became so coveted. The men were like all lobbying to get an invitation. <laughs> and so they came. They didn't go to the entire meeting. They came for this portion of the meeting that the men were invited to. And it turned out to be an amazing experience because... First of all, the men became aware of some of the issues that women talk about amongst ourselves. But beyond that, you had now senior men who were meeting junior women who they might not otherwise know. And they were meeting them in a way that now they have a connection to these women. So when you're talking about new assignments, prize projects, promotions, now they have this connection. Now they know these people. So it really, it was so good for both the, the women and for the men who came and I, I tell women's groups because I will also speak at women's groups and, and if it's a woman's only group, I will say to them, do me a favor and take some notes about what we are talking about and then share it with a man. <laughs> share it with your male colleagues. Yeah. They should know, they should know. And I think that's part of it is making them not, not biting their heads off. Um, and then from the male point of view, one of the things you hear, especially in the last year, are men who say, well, you know, with this whole Me Too thing, maybe I'm going to be falsely accused. So I don't want to hire women anymore. Like, I don't want to talk to women. I'm not going to mentor women. Yeah. To which I say, I have like zero patience for that. <laughs> Me too. I mean, the guys who are saying that, I'm sorry, the guys who are saying that are probably not mentoring women anyway. <laughs> yeah, let's be honest. Yeah. So, however, however, I will say that for men who legitimately do want to mentor women and who are looking for ways to do that. Um, you know, be, there, there is something to be said for um, uh, the ways in which mentorship relationships happen. So much of what happens in the workplace is about the relationships we build. And if you're in a male dominated workplace and the relationships are built on going out for a beer, um, you know, going to play golf or something that the women are not comfortable in, there are other ways to do this. And I, I again, I use the example of my own bosses who, who again, also did this for me. So my 
my boss did, he did have a poker game with the guys that I was not part of, but he did something else with me. So we both had kids. We would do, we, first of all, we would get together as couples, he and his wife, myself and my husband. So we would go out for like dinner or whatever, but we would also get together as families or with the kids and do family activities. And he wasn't doing that with the poker guys, yeah. but, but it had the same impact, which was we, ha we developed an, a, a relationship be beyond work that was um, that we got to know each other on a, on a personal level in a way that wasn't fraught. It wasn't about going out drinking or going out to private dinners or, you know what I'm saying? Like things that, that raise eyebrows. And it, but it, it did exactly the same thing, which is it creates those bonds that are so important to professional development. Absolutely. So it, it reminds me of one a picture that I used to use in my, I used to do diversity and inclusion training. I was one of those facilitators. And I have to say though, I always talked about unconscious bias, just sort of in my own, I'm reflecting on my own, you know, shortcomings perhaps. But um, there was a picture that I always used in my presentation and it was equality versus equity. Mm -hmm. And it was these little kids watching a baseball game and it was over a fence and the smallest ch child couldn't see over the fence because he was too short. And so equality had everyone standing on the same size box. And two of the kids couldn't see, the tallest kid could. Yeah. And it had equity being that the kids who were needed slightly larger boxes or more boxes were given those extra boxes so they had equal access to the game. Oh, that's great. I know, right? Yes. That's and amazing. that's exactly, and I love, so I love your example that you just shared because that's exactly what it is. We're not talking about having to treat men and women the same. And that's what I have so enjoyed about your book. And I've so enjoyed about the movement now is the recognition that we can have different needs and wants and desires. And we do as, right. um, you know, as different genders. Um, but we can still, in, in different ways, still have access to the same game. Right, exactly. That's exactly right. So we, we, there are so many ways in which we can do that. And I think the men who I interviewed, that was the secret sauce, is exactly what you're talking about. They realized that you know, pretending that we are all exactly the same is kind of a losing game because then the, the white guys with the privilege will continue to be the white guys with the privilege. And, and understanding also that we have different communication styles. There's just things that are different. I mean, our brains are different. Like we not, it, it, one of the things I did was I spent time in a, um, in a laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania where they were doing brain imaging. And they, this, this, these scientists were actually looking for something totally different. They were looking for, are there physical markers of schizophrenia? So they were just looking at thousands of brains. And what they found instead were that male and female brains process things. They're wired differently. And they said it doesn't have anything to do with intelligence, but it does do, it has to do with perception and how we take in information and how our brains process the information. So we perceive things differently. Um, there was another really, really fascinating piece of research that was related to that, um, which had to do with crying, um, mm -hmm. which was, so, so when I would interview men, I would, the first question I generally would ask would be, tell me what perplexes or flummoxes you about the women who you work with, your female colleagues, like where do you think is the biggest disconnect? And I was stunned at how many of these men responded, I'm afraid she'll cry. <laughs> Like that was bizarre to me because I am not a big crier at work. You don't want to see me like watching beaches or, you know, <laughs> or holiday commercials. Like I'll just, <laughs> but, but, um, but I'm not a big crier at work, but it turns out that women biologically, younger women in particular cry more than older men. The men I was speaking to were in positions of authority and they said they were really afraid that they would unintentionally say something that would hurt her feelings and make her cry. But the research tells us and of course, any woman will also tell you that when women do cry at work, it is not because their feelings are hurt. It is because they're pissed off. Yep. They're frustrated, they're furious, they're angry. And, but the men are not aware of that. And so it's part of that disconnect is just like misinterpreting each other. And the male, um, and this is a biological response, men want to comfort the woman and make her feel better. Mm -hmm. Well, when she's already angry or frustrated, 
<laughs> his reaction is exactly wrong. Like she's, he, and, and she makes her even more upset because he is not understanding what she is trying to get across to him. So, it, you know, there's just these disconnects that we need to understand. And so am I hearing that these are the kinds of conversations that we need to be bringing to the workplace? Yes. Absolutely. We need these conversations. And what we, the really important thing is we need these conversations to be made comfortable. Yes. And because, because right now that is a big barrier is that men aren't comfortable. And also we want these conversations to be had at a time absent stress. Like you don't want it to be when some guy says something really boneheaded to you. You don't want to like, you know, that's not the time to have the conversation. The time to have the conversation is in a, at a neutral point where we can talk about this. And, and that's why some of these um, interventions and some of these having allies, like that's what's so great about knowing before you go into the meeting that, you know, I'm always interrupted and having my friend, male or female, be the person who knows who's going to listen for that and be able to say, oh, wait, Joanne is speaking. I'd like to hear her finish, right? That's why that's so effective is because you're talking about it absent the stress moment. And then when the stress moment comes, you have a strategy to counteract it. And, and, that's, and that's really good advice, Joanne, that I need to heed myself. Um, I, because actually, while I was reading your book, and shortly after I read that piece about the interruptions, I was in a meeting. And I knew I, knew I got interrupted quite a lot in these meetings. Um, and instead of dealing with something in advance, I decided I was counting interruptions that everyone had all the other participants had. It was a small meeting and we've got really good relationships. Thank goodness. Because halfway through the meeting, I said, I'm wondering if I could provide you with some feedback to the, to the meeting leader. And I said, how many times I've been interrupted and how many times the males have been interrupted? His face just dropped. So thankfully it worked out okay, but that perhaps is a strategy, the one that you suggest about dealing with it in advance uh, would be a better approach. I actually like your approach. Sometimes you have to do that. I actually, I had a similar situation not long ago um, where I was at a table with, uh, it was a dinner table. There were four people, all, all professionals. And I asked a, two men, two women, and I asked a question and it was a gender related question. And the two men just like started blah, 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 blah. And they didn't stop talking. And I, I finally said, hey, time out, guys, time out. I said, I said, I really want to hear what the this woman has to say about it. And, and I said, by the way, guys, do you know that in a group like ours, women need to make up the majority before we get 50% of speaking time? And you have just demonstrated that. <laughs> and, and the guys were um, um, properly um, abashed by that, uh, <laughs> and then they did let the women speak. But they, it, it, but it was so interesting because it was a gender-related questions, and the guys were still mansplaining to the women at the table. Yeah. It's fascinating. <laughs> it's yeah. absolutely fascinating. Um, so, talk to me about mentorship in terms of so if there's someone listening right now who is in a position where she wants to get further ahead in the workplace, and she knows that she wants a mentor. Does she go for a man, woman? And how does someone navigate that? What guidance would you offer to her? Sure. So there's actually a lot of research on this point. And it, the research actually shows that formal mentorship programs are more effective than informal mentoring. Now, I've never experienced that personally. I'm just telling what the research says. And But the, the reason that the research concluded that is because in informal kinds of sponsorship opportunities, generally what ends up happening is women get mentors who give them advice, whereas men get what you call sponsors. And a spon the difference is a mentor can give you advice. A sponsor is somebody who can not only give you advice, but can get you the promotion or get you the next job. And women tend not to get that on their own, whereas men do. And uh, so these formal mentorship programs um, are seen as very successful. But the other thing is I would say um, and I heard this from senior women, don't just go for um, another woman to mentor you because she's female. You really want somebody who is professionally where you want to go and where you want to be. And it doesn't have anything to do with gender. Mm -hmm. I, I had a really revelatory discussion with a Harvard Business School professor, a woman, and she said, look, 
there's this sort of feeling that supposedly I'm supposed to mentor every woman here. And she said, first of all, I'm a Chinese scholar. Like somebody comes to me and they're in marketing. I have no idea. Like <laughs> I can't help them. And, and I don't, and I don't have time to listen to their boyfriend problems. Like, so the, <laughs> yeah. Well, like it, she said, it makes no sense. And, and then it also, as she says, you know, it ends up eating up. If you expect the senior woman to mentor all women, then all of a sudden the senior woman is being taken away from her day job. And, um, and that, uh, that also hurts the senior woman yeah. as well. So it's, I, yeah. I, I love all of that. And also that, you know, I, I think that if we are looking to women to mentor women all of the time, just because of gender alone, that's once again, making this issue a women's issue. Right, right. And this isn't all of us issue. And yeah. that, that is so key to the men who I spoke with were absolutely adamant that these very successful men um, who were really trying to close the gender gap, there were none of them who were like marching in women's marches with pus pink pussy hats on, right? They were, <laughs> these were, these were guys, they all said to me, look, I had a business problem, I needed to solve it, I needed the best possible people. And, it, and I understand that if I'm only picking from 50% of the team, then 50% uh, of the people in the gym, um, as opposed to everyone, I'm not going to have as good a team. Absolutely. It, it really comes down to that, doesn't it? Yes. So um, we have just a few minutes left, but I can't end this without asking you about leadership training. I myself have been on leadership training for women, and I felt like I had to change to adapt to this world that was created for, you know, this business world that was, so to speak, a man's, man's world. What's your per per perception or perspective on how we need to address leadership development training? Yes, so, so one of the issues I have with leadership training actually is that when they do different for leaders and for women. And um, I, if you look at leadership training generally, it generally is project oriented and it's about success and getting to the next level. Whereas if women's leadership very often is about soft skills. And so it's not directly related to your job. It's like, how do we network and things like that. And, um, and so I, at too often in organizations, you see women shunted in, you know, they don't get to go to the leadership training. They get shunted into the women's leadership. And that, I think that um, only exacerbates the imbalance. Um, but just in terms of um, uh, women's leadership, I mean, I do think that, you know, a lot of our problems will be solved when we do have more women in leadership because the idea is not for us to act like men. Mm -hmm. The idea is for us to use our particular skills to become leaders. And actually, if you look at the research, when you look at the list of adjectives used to describe um, excellent leadership, um, and then you look at which generally apply to women versus men, women have more of those qualities um, to, be, to be good leaders. But we we have to change our behavior. And frankly, my industry, the media industry, we need to change our behavior. There's research that shows that the media is much harder on female leaders. So for example, companies that are in trouble, if you look at media coverage, um, if, the, if the CEO is female, 80% of news coverage will blame her personally for the company's troubles. Whereas if it's a man, only a minority of news reports would blame the man. And so we also kind of bollocks ourselves up. We hold women to a higher standard and we make it much more personal. Women's mistakes are noticed more and they are remembered longer than those for men. So again, these are these unconscious things that we have to really be aware of so that we can pull back and, and, and be part of the solution. Uh, thank you so much for that answer. I think there's a lot of gems in that. And and thank you as well for all your time. It's come to a close. I have so enjoyed peeling back some of the layers of the onion. There's so many more layers still to peel back. But thank you for being part of this journey for me personally as I experienced your book and for sharing your time with, with me and my listeners today. Well, thank you, Louise. This has been a great conversation. I think we could talk all day. So thank you for, for having me for the hour. It's been great. Absolutely. Thank you, Joanne. And thanks to all of you as well, my loyal listeners. I hope that Many of you took away some tidbits and gems of your own. I invite and encourage you to grab this book. That's what she said. 
what men need to know and women need to tell them about working together. I would love to hear from you and your takeaways. You know how to reach me, louisehreed.com. You can find my email there and tell me your favorite tip and takeaway that you can find in Joanne's book. You can find me again here at this time on Contact Talk Radio Network. It has been a true pleasure spending an hour with you. And I'd like to encourage, as I always do, for all of you to be brave, be bold, and be happy. Until next Tuesday at this time, I'm Louise H. Reed, wishing you an amazing day. Goodbye, friends.